into the room, um, including the VIP here next to me. Um, so again, since, uh, since you missed it earlier on, I just wanted to uh, introduce the space again. Um, like I said, um, before the first uh, speaker, um, we wanted to have this town hall uh, in an inclusive space, in a black space as we're as I'm the president of the Black Democratic Club. We're going to be speaking to a lot of black issues here. Um, we wanted to have this meeting in a more informal format, um, no time limits on answers. We just kind of speak freely, um, get into the nuances of the issues that we're going to discuss. And uh, like I said, Richard Blackman here, the endorsement, uh, the chair of the endorsement committee, he'll be presenting two questions. Um, so without further ado, Council Member Susie Price. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, would so, you like me to start by introducing myself? Okay. Then we'll just go from there for okay. You guys had the worst view of me, but that's okay. Um, well, hi everybody. Um, I'm Susie Price. Thank you so much for um, staying to hear and get to know me a little bit. I really appreciate that. Um, just a little bit about me and my background. Um, I was born in the United States, but my mother and father are from the country of Iran. So we went back uh, when I was a baby, and at the age of seven, we left because there was a political revolution. And uh, women were not given the rights that we would hope women to have, and especially right now in the streets of Iran, there are protests. Women are still fighting for the right to be able to do basic things, like choose how they dress. Um, but we left the country when I was seven. I came to America. I learned how to speak English. I was raised by my mom, who was raising me as a single mom. She became a nurse um, in the US, and we moved around quite a bit, about 10 times between the ages of seven and 18 for me. We left behind my father and my three-year-old sister, um, and we were not allowed to go back into the country, so I didn't see them for 21 years. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, my mom really taught me a lot about the value of public service. She ended up finally getting a job as a public school nurse for LA Unified. Uh, which allowed her to be able to have some stability in raising me um, so that she wasn't working nights anymore, which was great. She retired after 42 years as a public school nurse for LA Unified School District, uh, which was great because it gave her a retirement and a pension so she could retire in dignity. I fell in love with the city of Long Beach when I moved here at the age of 18 to go to Long Beach State. Um, I worked my way through college. I've been working since I was 14. I tell everyone I've never called in sick. I actually go into work and get everybody else sick, but I never <laughs> call in sick because my mother taught me to never call in sick. I just work hard. Um, I worked my way through my bachelor's. I got my bachelor's um, in four years, and then I went on, I was a preschool teacher at the Isabel Patterson Child Development Center at Cal State Long Beach. And then I got uh, my master's in public policy and administration. I focused on city work and cities, um, how they respond to their constituents and how they should deliver service to constituents. I defended my master's thesis based on the city of Visalia. So that's always been in my mind. I went on to law school um, and I finished law school after three years. I was a night student. I worked full time in law school. I was an adjunct professor at Cal State Hayward. And I also ran a program in Oakland called Information on Ramps to Oakland. I went to law school in 1996 when the internet was brand new and we had computers that we took into community-based organizations. We had 12 community-based organizations, anywhere from substance abuse, um, sober living homes, um, literacy centers, faith-based organizations, um, all helping uh, mostly our reentry population um, and uh, black and brown men who were trying to get job security uh, to be able to have stable lives. And so we took computers in there with college students and we taught people how to use the internet, how to search for jobs, how to write a resume. It was a super rewarding experience and um, I loved it. 
My first summer in law school, I worked on a case um, with uh, at a DA's office. I was an intern. I worked on a rape case with a 17-year-old victim. It was a, a super um, heart-wrenching case. And at the end of the trial, we all got to hug the victim. And um, I hugged the victim. And at that moment, I don't know if you guys have ever had an experience like this. It was a power from above. I decided that I was going to commit my life to helping victims of crime. So for 24 years, I have helped victims of crime find a voice in a very scary criminal justice system. I have prosecuted domestic violence cases, sexual assault cases. I specialize with child victims, which is not a specialty anybody ever sets out to do in life, but it's a very rewarding specialty. And I work on homicide cases, um, and I specialize in vehicular homicides, and then a really unique category, shaken baby cases. Um, and so I've dealt with some of the worst types of cases, but in the process met some of the most amazing people. I don't prosecute cases anymore now. I oversee a program that I helped create called our Recidivism Reduction Mental Health Unit. I oversee our Mental Health Court, our Homeless Court, our Military Diversion Court, our Veterans Court. We even have a court called Whatever It Takes Court to try to get people to diversion and off the criminal justice pathway. I designed a program called First Point, which is an early interception program, where when the police come in contact with someone who's committing a low-level crime that's experiencing homelessness, the police will call our office out. We go out there with the Homeless Services um, Task Force, and we immediately offer the people service in lieu of them ever getting booked. So there's no record of them ever having contact with the police. We try to get them off of that criminal justice pathway if they're willing to go through an assessment. I'm super proud of that work. I attend parole hearings all the time and am involved in all of our reentry programs, uh, including connecting people with jobs, employment, and housing. And I'm very proud of the work that I do. I ran for city council eight years ago um, because I was on the PTA. It's, that's how my political uh, career started. I was student body president at Cal State Long Beach, but you know, for 24 years, I, that's not what I was doing. Um, we wanted a crosswalk in our neighborhood. Um, we have a park where kids used to run back and forth. There's a street that runs through the park. And um, at the time, I was a vehicular homicide prosecutor. I knew a lot about traffic safety, and I thought, this is dangerous. Someone's going to die here. And so I called. I had been a city attorney for a little bit of time, so I knew if you want anything done in the city, you have to call the traffic engineer. So I called the traffic engineer, and I said, we need a crosswalk on Elliott Street. And they called me back like three weeks later and said, um, the data doesn't support a, 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 a crosswalk. And I said, what do you mean? Can you come out and take a look when we have these concerts and you can see how the kids running back and forth? And they said, no, we don't, we don't. The concerts are at 530. Our office closes at five. We you can't send somebody out. And this was back in the Blackberry days. So I couldn't like record kids running across the street. There was no iPhone, you know, video then. Um, and so I couldn't really get City Hall to listen. So a lot of the moms said, you know, you should run for office. You do a good job on the PTA. You know, how different can it be? So I did. I ran for office, and I won at the primary. There were five people in the race. It had never happened in the history before. And I think the reason that I won was because there's just something very different um, about me, and you're gonna, you may like it, you may not like it, but I'm very authentic uh, to a fault. Um, I speak with honesty, and sometimes I don't say what everybody wants to hear, but I'll never lie to you, and I'll always be truthful about what we can and cannot do, because I think giving people false hope is the wrong way to partner with people. And so I've been really honest, and I think people really like that. I'm really proud of the work that I've done in my district over the last three years, but I mean eight years at District 3, but I'm also really proud of the work that I've done citywide. Um, so let me just touch on a couple of those things with you. Um, District-wide, you know, we have um, a lot of environmental assets in the third district, but we haven't taken good care of them. The Colorado Lagoon had an F rating. I don't know how many people have been to the Colorado Lagoon. It's, it's a beautiful body of water, but it was an F rating. People used to swim in it in the 20s and 30s. People would go there all the time for recreation. If you go there on a Saturday or a Sunday, there's people from all over the city that go there and picnic and enjoy it. There's baptisms going on out there every month, you know, but the water quality was so bad that people weren't even going in there for a baptism, right? And so, and that's like a one second dunk, right? Let alone swim. Um, so now um, we, we planted eel grass, which is not eels, but it's grass that looks like long spiny grass. And it added more oxygen to the water and it started to make the water quality better. So now we have birds and, and wildlife that we never had before. 
But in order for us to have good water quality forever, we needed to connect it to the bay. Because when you connect it to the bay, it has water circulation. Well, that was a very expensive project. So what we decided to do was to make the Colorado Lagoon a coastal mitigation bank. It's a super complex thing, but basically we created a bank out of this asset. And what that means is if there's an environment that's doing, or an entity that's doing something that's destructive to the environment, like the Port of Long Beach, they can purchase mitigation credits in another habitat in the region to restore some of the environmental impacts of what they're doing. So you're really creating like a banking instrument. It's a withdrawal and a deposit, right? They're damaging the environment here, but they can restore the environment here. So we created a banking instrument and the Colorado Lagoon is now the only coastal mitigation bank in the state of California. And we sold $28 million of credit to the port to be able to connect it to Colorado Lagoon. And that's starting in November. That was a huge project, huge project. Um, we also did something that I think we need to do citywide. We zoned for more open space. There are parts of the city that just do not have enough open space. And you can't take property away from people to make it open space. The city is never gonna have enough money to buy property to make open space. We just, we're, we have a $40 million deficit that we're looking at for next year because we just finished employee contracts. We don't have money to buy buildings and turn them into parks. But what we do have the right to do is areas that are around a sensitive habitat that are currently zoned for commercial or residential that you can never build on because they're bordering an environmental habitat or an open space, you can zone those as open space or recreation. And so we did that all around the wetlands. We had property that was zoned for residential or commercial and we said to the property owners, you're never gonna be able to build in this location because it's right next to a wetlands and the coastal commission's never gonna approve it. The neighbors are never gonna approve it. The noise, the lighting, the density, the parking issues, it's never gonna happen. So we rezoned those properties as open space for recreation so that they'll never be built on again. They'll be passive spaces to create open space. And I'm proud of that. Um, in terms of the homeless, crisis that we're all seeing, we built a, uh, we welcomed a transitional housing facility, which was a Motel 6 that is now a transitional <laughs> shelter that helps people get onto permanent supportive housing. And I'm really proud of that. It's, it's on, um, no, it's on 7th and Bellflower, the old Motel 6. Oh, so I'm um, by Dunkin' Donuts. Okay. It's practically across the street from Mark. My husband Mark is here, um, where Mark and I live. And um, you know the neighbors, as you can imagine, you know they're. What are the impacts going to be? Are there going to be lines around the building? Is there going to be people walking around at all times of the day and night? And I told them because I built a relationship of trust with my residents by being true to my word. I said, let me work with the operator. I will make sure the operator understands the concerns and we will work together to make sure the facility is run in a way that doesn't have the impacts that you're concerned about. Facility has been open for two years. Hundreds of people have been transitioned to permanent supportive subsidized housing and not one complaint from any neighbors about the facility. You wouldn't even know that it's there. They're doing such a great job. And the owner of the facility, her name is Katina Holiday, and she's an amazing woman. She runs a couple of different facilities all around the city of Long Beach and partnering with her has been a true joy. I also was the chair of the Public Safety Committee and I brought on things like the body-worn camera. Every police officer in the city of Long Beach now has a body-worn camera as a result of my advocacy. It was shameful that a city of our size with a police department of our size did not have that accountability and transparency measure that it should have had. And now every police officer has that. Um, I've done a lot of things that I'm very proud of, but tonight I look forward to talking with you about the issues that are of concern to you and figuring out how we're going to partner to help make Long Beach the community that you believe is necessary for us to all thrive together and hoping that you will partner with me and give me an invitation into your space so that I can learn what some of the challenges you're facing are and how I can partner with you to solve those. So I'm going to take a seat so that you can ask me questions. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Council Warren Price. Um, so you may have touched on a few of these things already in the introduction, but we're just going to ask for again and just work it. So the first question we have for you is, why did you make the decision to run for office? 
Well, I made the decision to run for office eight years ago. This is just an extension of that office. First, let me start by saying um, a lot of people that go to law school want to go into politics. That's what they start off wanting to go in. Um, I didn't. I have a career outside of politics that I'm really proud of. Um, and when I stepped up to run for city council, and Ebony back there worked on my first council campaign. Um, we had a beautiful relationship during that campaign and after, and um, it was she got to go along the journey with me as a first time candidate and kind of learn the kind moments and the harsh moments that you get when you're knocking on doors. And it's not easy to run for office. Um, but you know, we had a conversation as a family. Um, look, I have opportunities that my sister never had as an American woman. Um, I have freedoms that my sister never had. She didn't have the opportunities that I had being raised in Iran. Um, and so for me, I always said, my mom worked really hard to bring me here and give me opportunities. I wanna be a change maker. I don't wanna be the type of person that sits around and complains about what other people are doing or aren't doing. I wanna be part of the solution. And for me, honestly, I know it sounds silly, but I ran because I wanted that crosswalk. And it was very irritating to me that as a tax paying resident of this city, I couldn't get city hall to care enough to call me back. And then when they did call me back, they were so dismissive that to me, it just felt like, you know, why is that? And, and the other thing is that I was the first Democrat um, to win in the third district in 42 years. <laughs> I was the only member of the third district city council and continue to be who doesn't belong to the yacht club. Um, that's just not our, uh, that's not our, you know, we're a working family. My husband and I both work multiple jobs to be able to provide for our boys and pay our mortgage. I'm proud of that. Um, and so I thought, you know, we've had a bunch of men representing this district for decades who look nothing like me who have no understanding of the journey that my mother and I traveled for me to get to where I am. And how great would it be if we had a woman of color who was a working mom representing the third district? And um, I didn't think we could win. I mean, Mark, I love him, but he didn't think we could win. He said, uh, we have no money. Um, nobody thought I could win. He said, we have no money. We're not connected to anybody. Um, nobody knows you and you look different. You know, you're going to knock on the doors and people are going to say, and they say this all the time, you don't look like a Susie Price, you know? And I said, yeah, that's my married name. My name is Susie Aramesh Price. And um, Aramesh, where is that from? Are you from Iran? And that is, you know, you never say that to an Iranian because that's not how we pronounce the name. Um, but and then you tell them, no, it's Iran. And they go, yeah, whatever, Iran. You know, so we get that all the time. And so for me, it was, um, you know, it was about, serving my community, really. Um, and it was just an extension of what I had been doing. I'm really proud that I did. I'm really glad that I stepped up for a city that I loved. Um, and this is our landing place. Uh, I, hate, I hate to make it sound dramatic, but this is the end of the line for us. We've lived and worked at careers that we love and we're very proud of, and um, I'm not going anywhere. I'm gonna be a mayor with her eyes on Long Beach. I'm Ooh. gonna be a partner. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not looking elsewhere. When you start looking elsewhere, you forget to put your head where your feet are at, and uh, that's just human nature. Thank you. What are two or three strengths of which the city of Long Beach can be proud of, and why? Well, one, I would say our diversity. I mean, first of all, let me just stop for a moment to say, I am so proud of both Councilman Richardson and me for being where we are today. Neither of us had an easy journey in life. And sometimes when I think, I can't even talk about it with my mom because we both start crying. Never in my life did I ever think I would be where I am today, never. And the fact that this city gave me that opportunity shows what an amazing, diverse community this is. I mean, look at us, a black man and a immigrant from Iran, the country that the last president was not allowing people to travel here from, right? I'm running for mayor for the city. He's running for mayor for the city. And our residents are okay with that. That's cool. I love the fact that we're a huge urban city that feels like a small community, whatever neighborhood you go in. People know each other. You know, I just drove up here like a mad woman um, from a meet and greet in Cal Heights. 
that neighborhood, they're so tight. Everybody knows each other. They, it's like everybody lives in these bubbles, which is beautiful in some ways. In some ways it's not because they don't know what's going on elsewhere, what other people might need to thrive because they're only looking at the world from their lens. But the beauty that they feel pride in their bubble, in their neighborhood, in their business corridor, hopefully, or soon to be, is, is so unique to the city. I love that. Um, and then one of our strengths is obviously our port. Our port, as much as it is a detrimental impact on the environment, hopefully over time we're transitioning to lower emissions and zero emissions and mitigating the impact of the port. But the fact that the port provides hundreds of thousands of jobs, both directly and ancillary through other companies that feed into the port is such a tremendous opportunity for us. It's a gateway to the world. It's a job creator. And it is, I think, something a lot of people in the city don't know about. I didn't know about it. When I ran for office, my world was limited to a crosswalk and the PTA. I didn't know anything about the Port of Long Beach. I made it my mission to learn about the Port of Long Beach. And now that I know about the Port of Long Beach, it's unbelievable what a huge asset it is for the city of Long Beach and the potential that it offers us. Like right now, we're talking about transitioning to green jobs. We have space at the port to accommodate all sorts of new infrastructure for electric charging, electric charging of trucks, for onboard, on dock rail, for short haul trips. Right now, anytime a cargo gets put on a rail, I'm the chair of the Alameda's Corridor Transportation Authority. Anytime cargo gets put on a train, it's going out of state, it's going far away. If we had short haul rail, we can be taking trains to Bakersfield instead of trucks going back and forth to Bakersfield. So we have so much opportunity to be a port that truly is a green port, and that's one of the strengths of the city. Thank you. Um, the next question is, what are two degree challenges that must be priorities for the city of Long Beach to address and why? Uh, homelessness is right now our biggest challenge. Uh, we had a 62% <coughs> increase in homelessness while cities around us saw a reduction, bless you. Um, Orange County saw a 16% reduction. The city of LA only saw a 4% increase. There is absolutely no reason, and it's shameful, that we saw a 62% increase. And there's a lot of reasons for it. I'm proud that I'm the council person that brought the item to council <coughs> to have Metro change its end of the line practices. Now, I know that for two of my council colleagues that represent the downtown area, they were adamant that this is not a problem in downtown. And so they felt more comfortable with us sending a letter to say that we wanted to evaluate, not change the end of the line policies. But whether we're gonna evaluate or change, I think it's important that the issue is being looked at. Um, I'm happy to share a link to that meeting with you so that you can hear the testimony of the, the residents and also the comments of the council members. Um, I think it's important, but Metro actually took the issue up um, and they're going to put more resources into helping partner with us. Because right now what happens is at the end of the night at 1 a.m., the train stops at Pine and 3rd. And anywhere between 4 to 60 people get off the train. In fact, the residents went out there and videotaped it. Um, and they get off the train, whether they intended to be in Long Beach or not, they're pushed off of the train. I mean, it's such an inhumane way to treat people. There's no services there. There's no one there to say to them, do you have a place to sleep tonight? Can I help you get a place to sleep tonight? There's no services or shelters that are open at one in the morning. There's no restrooms there. So they're just wandering the streets. And I think that has contributed to the problem. It's not the entire problem. We also don't have a robust street outreach team. Street outreach allows people to build a relationship that results in people accepting services. There is no way to get people into services without building a relationship with them. No way. You can't police your way out of homelessness. It is not a crime. Some things that the homeless population are doing or might do might be a crime, but even then you can't police your way out of it. The only way to really transition people off of, and Marvin, you know this, off of homelessness is to connect them with services, whether it's a sober living home, whether it's a nonprofit, whether it's some temporary housing, but you can only do that if you build a relationship with them. And the way we've been doing it, we can't build a relationship with them because we have less than 20 people working on street outreach, 
They don't work in the evenings. They don't work on the weekends. And instead of having these outreach teams that we can't spread around the city to 3,300 people, my proposal is that we have nine nonprofits work with us, one for each council district, and they do the street outreach. And they go to a location that's a hot spot. They go there for two weeks. Nobody gets moved. Nobody gets a ticket, no police involvement, no one gets arrested. For two weeks, they go out there every day and they build a relationship. Good old fashioned way that you build a relationship. You get to know people. What's your name? Where was the last place you felt safe? What can I do to help you get there? Do you have a California ID card? Can I help you fill out the paperwork? They can't accept any services without it. Can we watch your pet for a few minutes while we go to the DMV and submit your paperwork? That kind of outreach we're not doing right now. The data shows you do that for eight to 10 days, somewhere around eight to 10 days. They recognize your face, your name, your voice, your, even the cadence of your conversation with positivity. And they're more inclined to accept a service. Once they accept a service, it's the entrance into the continuum of care. That's when you talk about transitional housing. You know, we've got amazing nonprofit partners here. <clears throat> TLH is one of them. Long Beach Rescue Mission is one of them. Long Beach Rescue Mission right now has 86 available beds. Why is the city not partnering with them? Why are we not putting 86 people off the street there right now? They will accept the service if we invest in them and meet them where they're at. We haven't been meeting people where they're at. So that's our number one challenge. Our second challenge is our budget. We have a $3.2 billion budget and every year we overspend, every year. And I know sometimes people don't like my position on things, but look, I've never overspent my council budget. I've never overspent my campaign budget. I think if you're gonna be the mayor of the city, you should know how to balance a budget and live within your means. That's my opinion. I've always lived within my means because my mother and I did not have a cushion. We've never filed for bankruptcy. We've never had to ask people you know, to bail us out of a situation. We have lived within our means. And my mother always taught me, if we cannot afford something, we don't charge it, we don't finance it, we don't buy it. Because once you do that, you're gonna get yourself into problems. You're not gonna be able to repay it. And that philosophy has always been with me. I treat the people's money as if it was my own money. And I'm very, very careful with it. We have a $25 million deficit that is going up to a $40 million <coughs> deficit because we just finished employee contracts. We're gonna have to say no to some things. We're just going to have to. You cannot, it feels really great on a Tuesday night to say yes to everything and have everybody clap. But it feels really bad when you have sleepless nights figuring out what service are we gonna have to cut? Who are we gonna have to say no to next year? As opposed to thinking smart up front and saying these are things we can't afford. We'd like to. It doesn't mean we're anti this or anti that, or we hate you. We just can't afford it. Successful cities are successful because they do the things that cities can do well for every community. The basic things that cities can do well, we should be doing well for every community. We should be picking up dumped items in every district in this city. We should be paving roads and fixing potholes in every district in this city. We should be removing graffiti in every district in the city. We should be maintaining medians in every district in the city. Street sweeping, refuse collection. We should be delivering consistent services at a gold standard. Once we're doing that, then we can say, what else can we spend our money on? But our deficit is a huge issue. And our third challenge, in my opinion, is crime. Crime is up in every category. It just is. And when we're talking about things like we need to have unarmed response teams for homelessness, we need less police officers, we need more unarmed response teams. That sounds really great. It does. I was a big proponent of it. I'm the one that brought forth our, our city to look at the CAHOOTS model. I, I'm the first council person. Let me know if you want to see the agenda item. Don't let anyone tell you any different. I'm the first council person that brought that item. I can share it with you. But I can tell you, we now have a situation where our unarmed teams are saying we're not going to go out without armed police officers because they're scared. Our librarians are saying, we're not coming to work unless you have armed security guards in the library to protect us. So sometimes an idea sounds good, but when we put it into practice, it doesn't work out. 
and crime is up in every category. Now, there's a couple of reasons crime is up in every category. I will tell you that I think when we passed Prop 47 eight years ago, there were some good things that came with it, but there were some unintended consequences. Let me start with one of them. If you steal something that's under $950 one time or 15 times, the consequence is the same. Before Prop, it's a misdemeanor. Before Prop 47 was passed, it would still be a misdemeanor, but if you did it 15 times, it would get added as an enhancement elevated to a felony. <coughs> what happens when you're looking at a felony versus a misdemeanor? You have a lot more incentive to do the work you might need to do to get that felony dismissed. So you think about all these collaborative courts that I oversee. Let's talk about drug court. Most people steal because they have a drug addiction. Most people. Some people steal because they need diapers and they can't afford diapers for their kid. Very small number of people that are stealing because of need. Most people are stealing because it's currency for a drug addiction. Okay? That's, that's just the reality. Anyone that tells you otherwise doesn't know anything about the criminal justice system. They're reading too many books. They're not in practical world. So what happens now is you go to drug court and the drug will, the judge will say to you, you can serve 18 months, or no, not serve, you can do an 18 month program in this drug court where the DA is rooting for your success, probation's rooting for your success, healthcare agency gives you a therapist, <coughs> your public defender is rooting for your success, the judge is rooting for your success, you come back every two weeks, you read us your progress report, we all clap, everyone gets a gift card, we celebrate your graduation, 18 months later, your whole family comes, we all cry, we hug, it's amazing, you have a job, okay? We dismiss all your felonies. The one that you're facing today and any other felony you've ever accrued in your life, they all go away. That's a great incentive. Now, people go and the judge says, you're looking at a misdemeanor. You can get five days in jail for which you get credit for half time served. So that's 2.5 days and you have a misdemeanor on your record, or you can do this 18 month program and have, a, have your misdemeanor reduced. Nobody cares about having a misdemeanor on the record because you can expunge a misdemeanor after your probation's over. Probation's only one year. So you can serve probation for one year, you ask, you expunge your misdemeanor, it's not on your record. Seven out of 10 people have a DUI or know someone who has a DUI. That's a misdemeanor. Misdemeanor's not gonna keep you out of a job, it's not gonna keep you out of housing, felony will. So taking away any opportunity to aggregate those cases and make them a felony has actually disincentivized treatment. Same thing with possession of drugs. Do I think possession of drugs should be a felony? No way. No, it shouldn't be a felony. It should be a misdemeanor. But there's no arm, there's no incentive to get people into drug rehab. Prop 47 got rid of that. So crime is up because most people don't start their criminal activity by going into someone's house to steal something. That's a strike offense. If you go into someone's house or even their garage and steal something, that's a serious and violent felony. It qualifies as a strike, okay? You get a strike on your record, chances are you're never coming out of the criminal justice system. That's just how the system is set up. You don't wanna get a strike. But what happens now with Prop 47 is people start shoplifting.